Apartheid Israel turns its weapons onto Janine, the context crucial to the coverage of the story. A couple of tech titans slug it out online as Meta launches its potential Twitter killer called Threads, and giving Hollywood a helping hand. The cultural consultants looking to make the industry more politically correct. Hello, I'm Richard Gisbert, and you're at The Listening Post, where we dig into the coverage and analyze how news gets reported. The city of Janine is dealing with the aftermath of one of the worst Israeli military attacks on the occupied West Bank in 20 years. At least 12 Palestinians were killed and one Israeli soldier. The Israelis are describing the raid, which included airstrikes, as necessary. They call Janine a hotbed of terrorist activity. What is missing from that narrative? is the context. 56 years of occupation and oppression at the hands of what human rights groups now call an openly apartheid state. Israeli settlers, usually backed by soldiers who now take their orders from the most far-right government in the country's history, are conducting pogroms, forcing Palestinians out of homes their families have been in for generations. Israel's claim to those homes is based on nothing more than the fact that the settlers are Jewish and Palestinians are not. That's just not the story about Palestine and the occupation that Israel wants the global media to focus on or wants the world to see. Hi, everyone. Today, we're going to learn how to read the news about Israel. Viewer warning, courtesy of the Israeli government. Some reports completely distort the facts. Quotation marks are used to label the word terrorist, undermining its validity. At a time of escalating violence on the West Bank, taking place under the most extreme far-right government Israel has ever had, the country's Ministry for Public Diplomacy is taking issue with the coverage of Palestinian attacks against Israelis. Why are the murderers hidden or victimized? Why are they not described accurately for who they are and what they've done? This is not journalism. And this... Addressing foreign news organizations, saying they should call the Palestinians involved terrorists. It's part of a propaganda push when what Israeli forces and settlers are doing is impossible to defend. Share the truth. Let's fight the fake. Videos like that, telling Israelis not to trust foreign media, are kind of a long-running theme in Israeli society. If you want to know what's really going on, follow the online accounts of the Israeli Ministry of Public Diplomacy. The idea that only Israel knows what it's, what's good for it. Only Israel has the justification it, it has for, for doing what it does, for committing the war crimes it commits. The international media, they make it look like Israel is an aggressor when the truth is it's an underdog. It's one Jewish state, there are 22 Arab states, 57 Muslim states. There are a lot of countries around us, unfortunately, that haven't given up their hope of, uh, of destroying that one Jewish state. And so the, the coverage uh, gets swayed because people want to support an underdog, but it's not portraying an accurate picture. That's according to the head of an Israeli News Watch website, whose funding is a mystery. It's part of a larger PR effort to pressure international news outlets, lobbyists who routinely smear Palestinian journalists reporting on their own story. The narrative they push, that of the underdog, under a constant external existential threat, is one Israelis have long relied upon to justify assaults like the one this past week on Janine, a city Israel calls a hotbed of Palestinian resistance. The attack marked one of the most aggressive Israeli military incursions into the West Bank in 20 years. Cities like Janine and Nablus have recently produced localized armed resistance groups made up of young fighters, many of them born during the Second Intifada, who are tired of waiting for Palestinian politicians to protect them from the settlers and soldiers Israel is sending in. Most of them are not really affiliated with any political party. So in the past, Palestinian armed groups were very closely tied to uh, political factions. What we're seeing now in places like Janine and Nablus is young men seeing these Palestinian political parties as obstacles to their own freedom and their dignity, as collaborators with the Israeli occupation, especially through the Palestinian Authority, Fatah, ruled by President Mahmoud Abbas. Another factor that really defines these militant groups is that they're much more decentralized. These are uh, basically 
children and teenagers who have lived their entire lives under Israeli military occupation, and they've gotten to the point in their lives where they have no other option other than to take up a gun, take up a rock, take up a Molotov cocktail, and use it against an invading military that is invading their homes and threatening their families. And that's what it is. And they're a lot more grassroots led. They tend to use platforms like Telegram and WhatsApp to communicate, which is great for, for mobilization purposes. But it's also more dangerous for them because it exposes them to, to Israeli intelligence, and their families to potential targeting. The raid on Janine followed a steady spiraling of violence against Palestinians, much of it driven by Jewish settlers. On June 21st, the town of Turmas Aya was targeted by settlers on a rampage that even Israeli military officers described as a pogrom. Senior Israeli officers are clearly conflicted by the far-right elements in this latest Netanyahu government, including two settlers turned ministers, Bezalel Smotrich, who was the de facto governor of the West Bank, and Itamar ben Gavi, the Minister for National Security, who was previously convicted of hate crimes against Palestinians. The two extremists have egged on settlers who know they can count on the protection of Israeli troops. After the pogrom at Turmas Aya, the Israeli army insisted it had no idea what was coming even though the attack was organized online, in the open, and the Israeli authorities have some of the most sophisticated surveillance technology anywhere. Settlers uh, have their own communication channels, just like anyone in our region today. They're organizing on WhatsApp, they're organizing on Telegram groups, different uh, social media, and on open message boards. And these are not secure or secret communications. You don't have to be a, an incredibly well-equipped security force in order to realize that this is going to happen and to deploy accordingly. And this is why this narrative that they don't know what's going on and has no basis in reality. They can always know. The issue is that they have no interest in stopping them and putting a blockage on Israeli settlers to organize kinds of violence or to incite against Palestinians to make these kind of racist statements. The primary concern of the Israeli security establishment and all its institutions is entirely about keeping Palestinians in their place. Netanyahu realized that this was a mistake and then he committed to taking action to prevent it from happening in the future. Uh, and uh, the Israeli army and the police are committed to that. But it's very important to emphasize that was an unfortunate phenomenon that they will work to make sure will not happen again. It has no connection whatsoever to what happened in Janine over the past week. Arguments like that one, that there is no complicity or connivance on the part of the Israeli military in dealing with the settlers have been shredded, largely by the video evidence that keeps piling up. Those videos are provided by journalists who risk their lives to cover this story, and by ordinary Palestinians documenting the theft of their homes. Evidence that has repeatedly proven that when Israeli security forces are there for those pogroms, they take the settlers' side. Thus, the need for that other Israeli operation, the informational offensive, designed to make sure that the occupier's version of this story <laughs> prevails over that of the occupied. Official Israeli spokespeople uh, in in constantly framing these operations simply as a counter-terror operation have to divorce it from context, right? The idea is that Palestinians are inherently, innately violent, they hate us because we're Jews, they have no other reason to want to revenge uh, our actions and this is essential in order to make sure that Israelis don't think about this cycle of violence, constantly trying to frame Palestinians as terrorists, any sort of international reportage that does not in lockstep 100% with the Israeli government line is anti-Semitic, anti-Israeli, a lie. Any form of just reasonable, nuanced international coverage 
of news is unacceptable from their perspective. And this is where international media really needs to step in. It needs to highlight that it's not a conflict between two sides. It is an occupier and an occupied. It is an apartheid regime trying to maintain the stability of that system, that that is the inherent status quo of a massive power asymmetry in which one society rules over the other. And that is a system that needs to be put at front and center in all international media. It is the context that matters. It really boils down to this, this issue is that the international community, the countries that matter, really have refused to hold Israel accountable. If the U.S. held Israel to the same standards it holds the, the rest of the world, Israel wouldn't be driving bulldozers through Janine. It's, it's as simple as that. For Twitter users, and there are millions of them, who disapprove of Elon Musk and the changes he has made to the site, this was the dilemma. Where else can we go? What other platforms can do what Twitter does? This past week provided them with an answer. And Meenakshi Ravi is here with more on that. Richard, there is a new competitor in the fray now, and it isn't some upstart. It's Meta, the company that owns Facebook, WhatsApp, and Instagram. This past week, Meta launched a new app, one that it says is designed for text-based conversation, called Threads. It is a direct challenger to Twitter, and the announcement could not have been better timed. Just days earlier, Musk had announced temporary new limits to the number of tweets users can view. He said it was motivated by concern about data scraping. He was referring to generative AI companies using the vast amounts of text on Twitter to train their AI models. It was also a clear push to get more users to sign up to the premium service, Twitter Blue. The chaos at Musk's Twitter, the Muskverse, has left the field open for competitors, sites like Mastodon and Blue Sky. But this is the first big move by Meta. During the announcement of Threads, Meta's chief product officer, Chris Cox, took a swipe at Musk and his style of leadership. He said, we've been hearing from creators and public figures who are interested in having a platform that is sanely run, that they believe they can trust and rely upon for distribution. Meta has a significant advantage over other Twitter challengers. It already has billions of users. On day one of Threads, the company said 10 million people signed onto the app within seven hours. Musk would have known Threads was coming. In fact, rumors of the app last month triggered talk of Meta CEO Mark Zuckerberg and Musk planning to stage a public cage fight, a physical fight. The memes were as absurd as the actual stunt would have been had it happened. But we were spared, and the two men are keeping their battles virtual for now. Thanks, Mina. The Little Mermaid, Ms. Marvel, Encanto. What do those three Disney productions have in common? They are all films and series that have relied on cultural consultants, a new role introduced to address issues of diversity and representation. Movements like Me Too, Black Lives Matter, and Stop Asian Hate have helped change people's thinking on issues related to social justice. And cultural consultants are getting hired to help Hollywood get with the program. They're now included on production teams to provide perspectives that might otherwise be lacking in writers' rooms that are predominantly white and Western. They raise red flags on everything from gender to ethnicity. The Listening Post's Flo Phillips now on the role of cultural consultants and whether the changes they are helping Hollywood make are enough. Describe how you first met. Uh, it, was, uh, it was in Colombia. Pogata. It's 2005, and Mr. and Mrs. Smith is a box office hit, grossing more than $50 million in its opening weekend alone. There's an helicopter arriving to Bogota, like tuku 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 tuku. And it's only like a rural area with a lot of bombs, like boom. Bah! Boom! Bogota, Colombia. For Edna Liliana Valencia Morillo, a Colombian. It's smacked of stereotypes and cliches. And then a beer and someone looks like Pablo Escobar, some, something like that. And then Mr. and Mrs. Me trying to, uh, you know, uh, fight against the criminal people in Colombia. And that's the thing about Hollywood. Since its creation more than 100 years ago, it's been making movies for audiences that are a reflection of itself, Western and white. Some of the most, you know, kind of canonical films have featured very problematic representations of particular groups. One 
really uh, key example was Breakfast at Tiffany's, where Mickey Rooney was a white actor, played a very, very racist stereotype of a Chinese person. Don't be angry, you dear little man. I won't do it again. In recent times, I can't help but think of Hollywood's depiction of the Middle East. Go on outside. Ben Affleck's Argo is a depiction of Iran made by people who have never been to Iran. There are a lot of TV shows and a lot of films that have not aged well. I'm the man up in this piece. You'll never see the light of day. The way that black communities in America have been impacted and the way that we talk about law enforcement and the way that we talk about violence and drugs. <laughs> When you think about Asian American communities and you talk about things like sexuality and desirability. I didn't order anything, not even you. When you talk about women and you talk about women being in roles and in positions where they're not empowered and it's sort of reinforcing this idea that that gender disparity between men and women. When we think about the entertainment industry, there hasn't really been a focus on the cultural sensitivity. That's changing. As movie junkies, the people who actually sit through the closing credits will tell you, there's a new category scrolling by, the cultural consultant. Hollywood has been using outside expertise for years. In The Exorcist, the part of the priest was played by a former priest. There were real life pilots in the 9-11 based film United 93. And when it comes to war, the so-called military entertainment complex, Department of Defense officials have been brought in to help produce Pentagon propaganda hundreds of times. Good morning, aviators. With social movements like Me Too and Black Lives Matter forcing a reckoning in the United States and beyond, a demand for a different kind of expertise has emerged. What time is it? Time's up! What and realizing their time really is up. Hollywood, an industry that is slow to change, has started signing contracts with cultural consultants. The cultural consultant's role inside of Hollywood is to really help the creators ensure that what they're doing is actually going to be productive for the cultures that are being represented. And it's not going to inadvertently cause people harm or going to further sort of focus in on tropes or stereotypes. And it's become a whole industry in itself. Ray Nijan is one of the founders of Culture House, a New York-based production company run by and for cultural consultants. Their services span the gamut of production from casting to marketing, providing holistic support to storytellers out to challenge the dominant narratives in the media. What we're doing is that we are sort of the aggregators and we sort of are able to support them and say okay if you want to be thinking about this community let's really look at the cast of characters that you're putting together let's really help you to consult and talk with the right folks to make sure that those characters feel really authentic to the time and to the place Nijin is talking about someone like Valencia Morillo who was an Afro-Colombian has experienced racism and discrimination in one of Latin America's most class-ridden societies. That resulting experience is what made her valuable to the producers of Disney's recent hit, Encanto. I was part of the team of uh, cultural trust uh, for, that Walt Disney creates to help them to represent Colombia in, the, in a better way. I was in charge of the representation of black people in the movie. Representation is not a easy thing to do, but black representation is even more difficult because we used to see black people from the stereotype of poverty or slavery or being ugly, for example, bad hair, that kind of concepts. Cultural consulting was to put in the table how the diversity of black culture in Colombia can be represented from a, a perspective of dignity, that's very important to me, and also with the um, the possibility to inspire new generations. You're impressed, imagine how I feel, Mom. I grew up admiring princesses of Walt Disney and feeling myself ugly, you know? So to me, this is amazing that I help them to understand why Afro hair was so important to be in the movie. Got every generation. It's the first time you see Afro hairs in a Walt Disney movie. And it's the first time you see the 12 textures of hair in the 12 members of the family Madrigal. Cultural consulting, to me, is taking into account 
the vision of how a population see themselves. We are trying to avoid that kind of view of, the, of describing a population from outside and not having the point of view of the people inside. At last year's award ceremonies, the film industry's annual celebrations of itself, Encanto won big. It's part of a growing collection of film and TV series that have put representation at their core. You're the girl with the deaf family? Take Coda, the Oscar-winning film about a hearing child in an otherwise deaf family. We've been around since there was uh, footage. You just have to look for us. Disclosure, the Netflix original that looks at transgender depictions within Hollywood. Or Marvel's first live-action Muslim superhero, Ms. Marvel. All signs of progress. But for others from these communities working in the industry, cultural consultancy is like a band-aid, a giant one, covering up a problem that runs deep. The idea is not for us as consultants to come in and now larger organizations or corporations can say, see, we have diversity. No, no, no. Cultural consultants are there to support a writer's room. And often that writer's room, regardless of whether there's cultural consultants or not, has to be incredibly diverse. That is a completely separate consideration. And if anything, so much of what we've learned and seen is that there are many writers' room where you have a couple of black folks or queer folks or brown folks, and every time a storyline around one of those communities comes up, everyone looks at that person like, hey, tell us what the black community thinks. That's not fair. For me, in order to make a positive step at least, and it will only ever be a step, Culture industries need to do better in terms of making their organisations more representative of society at large. So what I would rather ensure is a parity of participation, if you like, that everyone, no matter their background, has an opportunity to create stories on a mass scale which can be shared with everyone, with a wide range of audiences. For me, that is the bigger issue. And if we get that right, we won't need cultural consultants that role would be redundant. Hollywood's not there yet, so the next time you watch a film and you're not offended, maybe stick around for a few minutes and consult the credits for the reason why. And finally, the Iranian government is known for censoring the internet, shutting down sites and platforms when they're producing politically problematic content. And Iranians have grown adept at circumventing those shutdowns. One of Iran's state-controlled TV channels, Nassim, is used to playing by the rules. It had a talent competition recently that showcased some young girls singing a pro-censorship tune called Filter It With Your Intellect. Not exactly a catchy title. The song implores Iranians to close their eyes to the darkness on the Internet, turn their backs to the ugliness online. The judges employed by that same state-controlled channel approved of the song as well they should. We'll see you next time here at The Listening Post. I'm not